Well, good morning, and thank you all for joining with us this morning as we are in day 17 of our 21-day journey through the Gospel of John. I have been longing for this passage ever since we started the Gospel of John. I love the story that we see here in John 17 as Jesus prays for himself, prays for his disciples, and then, believe it or not, he prays for you and me. And when I first found out that he prayed for me before his arrest, it changed a lot of things in my life. It changed the perspective I have about myself. It changed the perspective I have about Jesus. Hopefully, you find the same thing. Uh, the story is that right before Jesus is arrested, he goes to Gethsemane to pray. And you know the stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that he talks about how Jesus was in such agony as he prays for the hour that was at hand. He prays and he so, feels so much sorrow and so much agony, he sweats out drops of blood. John doesn't cover that part, but he covers just the prayer that he has. But imagine that's the spirit that he is in. That's the spirit that he is feeling. That's the agony he's feeling as he prays for these three things. He prays first for himself and he prays that he may be glorified so that God would be glorified. He prays that as he goes to the cross, as he's crucified, that he would be glorified as the world looks and sees his body hanging there. And then after that moment he'd be resurrected and he would only be resurrected so that God would get would get all the glory and all the honor and praise. That's what his entire purpose was to give God glory, to reveal God to man. And he prays there specifically, you know, in the other gospels that he that you know <clears throat> that if it were able that this cup would pass for him, that this opportunity, that he wouldn't have to do it. There's another way to do it. But he says there, not my will, but yours be done. Even to the very end, Jesus was submissive and obedient to the Father. That's why Philippians 2 says he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He did not He did not await what was coming. He, did not, he wasn't excited about it, but he, he longed for what was coming afterwards. That's why he longed to be back in the presence of his Father, to be back in the glory that he experienced before the foundations of the world. To be back in the love that was that where he was loved by the Father before the world even existed. So that's why he prays for himself. And he prays that the world may know him because of what's getting ready to happen. And the word know is not just a knowledge, not just a you know, just an idea of who God is. It's actually an intimate word. It's that idea of knowing one another, that that the world may know him and that they may know the Father. That's what his entire purpose of eternal life is, that we may know who Jesus is. And he goes on to talk about, after praying for that, he prays for his disciples. He prays for those 11, those 11 faithful men and women, faithful men who are still following him. Those who have not fallen away, but they will, you know, they'll, they will scatter. They will betray him in the coming, in the coming minutes. And he also prays for them. He prays for them to be one, just as he and the Father are one. He prays for unity amongst them, that they may be perfectly one. Because he is getting ready to leave this world, and they're going to be the primary hands and feet of his ministry. They're going to be the ones doing the works that he's been doing. Remember, he said that you guys, through the work of the Holy Spirit, will do a greater work. So it's to your advantage that I leave you. And he's praying for them here that they may be kept, they may be protected from the evil one, meaning Satan himself, that God would wrap his arms around these men as they explode and as they leave the church, as they become pillars of the church, as they become his hands and feet here on this earth. He prays that they may be one. Because that oneness, that unity will bring joy, that unity will bring sanctification, that, that, that working of us becoming more and more like Jesus. Because instead of becoming more and more like one another, they will become more and more like Jesus when they are unified behind this purpose, when they're unified behind that will, when they're unified behind that love and that glory, that honor that God deserves, not themselves. And we know that that's going to happen because right after this passage, as we will see Jesus arrested, then we'll see him crucified, then we'll see him resurrected. And in the very next book, in the book of Acts, Jesus gives him the final command to go into the a world and make disciples of him. And they'll become his witnesses to the very ends of the earth. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls on them at Pentecost and the church explodes. And it goes to the very ends of the earth. And that's why he prays not only just for his disciples to be one. That's why he prays for you and me when he says in verse 20, I love this. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That you and I sit here today because we have believed because of their word. These men were just faithful men and women. We talk about the other people who followed Jesus. But they all came from different backgrounds. They weren't united in common, you know, they weren't united in background. They were they weren't uniformed. They were united in the person of Jesus. They came from from being fishermen, carpenters, tax collectors, and terrible sinners. I mean, they, they came and they were united in Jesus. And because of their testimony, because they were faithful men and women here because of their encounter with Jesus, they led a, a movement and, a, and that created a moment for us later, 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years later, 
to have it to experience for ourselves having an encounter with Jesus. Because of their encounter, we can have an encounter. Because of their testimony, we now have a testimony. And it doesn't stop with us that maybe a hundred years from now, someone will remember you and someone will say, I believe because of their story. Or maybe a thousand years from now, unless Jesus comes back, and hopefully he does before then, you know, we think about a thousand years from now, there'll be men and women saying, man, not only the witness of, you know, these people in John 17, the people in the book of Acts, but also remember the people of 2020. Remember that remember their testimony? They'll, they'll, they'll study about that. But ultimately, it's not because of anything that we do that's special. It's all because we were united, that we were perfectly one in the person and the purpose of Jesus. That's what he prays for, that we may be one as he and the Father are one. That's why he says specifically that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me, I am in you, that they also may be, they also may be in us. For this reason, verse 21, that, excuse me, verse 20, yeah, verse 21, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The entire purpose of us being united is so that everyone will see Jesus and know that he was sent by God. Not to see us, not to see our works, but to see Jesus and to give glory to God. And God and Jesus moves on to say, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with us and where I am to see my glory as you have given me because you love me before the foundations of the world. His goal is that you and I would be united, that the world may know that he was sent by God so that we would all be with him. Jesus came so that we would be with him, to be with him like God was walking in an intimate relationship, intimate knowledge with Adam and Eve back in Genesis 1 and 2. That's what he desires for us. That's why he came to bridge that gap between us and God, to bring us back into a relationship with him so that we would know who he was and know him and experience him and experience the glory, to experience the love that Jesus had felt. And I love that verse, that he felt before the foundations of the world that their father loved Jesus. And so he also loves Jesus us. Now think about this prayer. Now hopefully it changes your perspective like it changed mine. That 2,000 years ago, right before he was arrested, in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all the agony, he felt necessary to pray for himself, to pray for his disciples, but also to pray for us and for you and for me. And the prayer was that we would be one so that God would be glorified. The world may know who he is, and that we would all experience that same joy and peace and knowledge when we spend eternity with Him. I love that. And I think about the way it applies today on whatever day is, April 8th, 2020. You know, I think about the season of life that we are in right now. It's COVID-19 season. Uh, what are, you know, when I think, when I look at the, when we look at the history books in a few years, what is going to be the defining characteristic of the church in 2020? What's going to be the united purpose of the United States in 2020? When I look around the world right now, we are united behind one thing right now. We are united behind this pandemic. We're united in fighting this pandemic. You know, we all we all desire that this would end. No, I don't think there's, there's unless there's someone in the world that is so evil and messed up that they, they want to continue, but everyone should be, it should be behind this idea of stopping this. And we can see the way people are responding to this. We can see the people with the way that they are working to end this. Man, can you believe, can you imagine what would happen if the body of Christ was united behind Jesus the way they should be? See, what usually what we're doing is we're calling people to uniformity, not un unity. We're calling for people to be more like the Baptist Church. We're calling people to be more like the Methodist Church. And we get so fixated on doctrines that we don't really care anymore. But can you imagine if we were so fixated and focused on Jesus and we all got united behind him as a church, that how the world would be different in this season? Because people right now are looking for hope, not looking for doctrine. We're looking for a person in Jesus, and we have him. That's what we need to present. That's who we need to give glory to. That's who we need to honor. That's who we need to show them. That's who we need to show our encounter. That's who we need to witness about. Not, not the differences between the two of us, or the three of us, or the 27 of us, whatever. We need to be united behind Jesus. And look around the world right now. The church has an opportunity. And just talking with a couple other church leaders, the, our reach right now is bigger than what it's been. It's weird. You know, we're, we're showing you videos, we're showing you live streams, we're showing you different stuff, and our reach is actually getting bigger. People are watching stuff that don't even attend our church. People are watching, sharing stuff that attend other churches. Our reach right now is bigger. Why? Because people want to know that there is a purpose right now. People want to know that there is hope right now, and it's all found in the person of Jesus, and you and I need to be united behind that. We need to be united in love. We need to be united in spirit and united in mind, united in that purpose behind the will of God and submit, just like Jesus submitted to that will, and share that with 
the world, to lay aside the differences, to lay aside the doctrinal differences, to lay aside the arguments and the, the debates and focus in on Jesus, the one who brings us sanctification, the one who brings us joy, the one who brings us love and meaning, the one who's worthy of honor, the one who went to the cross, the one who went to the death, the one who went into the tomb, the one who was resurrected. And because he was resurrected, you and I can too. Now think about the moment that we have this coming Sunday and Easter Sunday. <laughs> the enemy thinks he's won because we won't be able to celebrate together in, in, in physical body on Easter Sunday. But look at the technology that we have. We're going to join together by video stream. We're going to join together with the millions of the billions of Christians around the world who are going to watch. From around the world, they're going to watch different video streams of the message of Jesus in his resurrection. And in that story, they will find not only was Jesus resurrected, you and I can have our resurrection day too. And right now, if we get united behind the purpose and person of Jesus, there are going to be thousands upon thousands of people who can have their resurrection day too because of our testimony and because of our unity. So this morning, today, as we move closer to Easter, what can you do to be more united with the church? What can you be? What can you do to be more united with Jesus? What are you doing that's disrupting unity? What are you doing that's removing that joy? What can you do? How can you play your role in the unity of the church? And how can you be a person that is a witness and that may someone may know who Jesus is because of your testimony? Think about that throughout your day today. And may we all pray that we may be perfectly one, just as Jesus and the Father are one. Love you guys. We'll see you all tomorrow.